Greetings. My name is Dennis Bigus. You're watching Our Money, the program on anti-corruption investigations, the program about equality and happy childhood. Let's start with childhood. If you watch our program, and I sure hope that's true, then you must know that last year we made a series of investigations on corruption in the Ministry of Justice, the Ministry's Executive Service, and the role of Mr. Minister in all this. Those were some really sad investigations because Minister Petrenko entered his office as a reformer. He made the ministry undergo several reforms, including that of the executive service. Time went by, so did the reforms. Some of them went the completely wrong way, and the ministry services started talking about corruption, monopoly, underbosses, control over financial flows, pressure on notaries. Meanwhile, the numbers on the minister's declaration went up. However, they went up very slowly slowly, like too slowly, inconsistent with the rumors going around the ministry. Maxim Panasenko and Maria Zemlyaska found the person whose rate of enrichment is consistent with the rate of the reform implementation in the ministry. It turned out to be a 20-year-old student, the minister's niece. We heard a lot of versions of why the young woman has all those things you'll see in the report, but most of them are ridiculous. Take a look for yourself. The Minister of Justice Pavlo Petrenko spent his May vacation in Turkey. He wasn't alone, but with relatives, who he paid for, he says. I have sufficient income to afford this kind of vacation for myself and my close ones, so there's no problem here. The video from his vacation was published by Andriy Portnov, a well-wisher from the Yanukovych team. It shows the minister's companions. The quality isn't that good, but it's most probable that those are his sister Oksana Petrenko and her daughter, that is, the minister's niece, Bojana Klitschuk. Those exact days, the niece regularly posted photos of Turkey in general and of the hotel Petrenko stayed at with his family in particular. What interested us in the story is not the vacation, but the niece he says he paid for. Recently, the niece just out of university acquired several luxury assets. They were bought after Pavlo Petrenko became the Minister of Justice. The young woman didn't have an income to buy them, so whose money was it? Kiev Pechers District, Yevgena Konovalsia Street, densely packed with elite residential buildings and a center of gravity for Ukrainian officials. This is where Anton Harashenko lives, the MP from the People's Front Party. Nearby flats are owned by the mothers of MPs Oleg Lyashko and Andriy Lozovy of the Radical Party. Relatives of the Defense Council Secretary Alexander Torchinov own a part of it as well. At the end of 2015, Bojana Klitschuk, the niece of the Minister of Justice, also became an owner of a two-room flat here. Currently, the prices for similar apartments start at $95,000. In two months, the student got another, even larger flat. Nearby in the residential complex Panorama, the average price for similar ones is $135,000. In less than a year, Bojana Klitschuk improved her Kiev millionaire image with a luxury crossover Lexus NX200. A new one cost from $38,000. In total, the students spent around $270,000 in 11 months. In February, the on-paper millionaire started looking for a job as a personal assistant. She put her CV on the internet, it has all of her work experience. Her latest position was a junior economist at a private firm. Before that, she assisted an accountant at Zamler Ukraina, the company where Petrenko once held a share. You won't earn that much as a junior economist or an assistant accountant, even at your uncle's firm. Maybe the minister invested in the property himself. Of course I… so you didn't help? I help my mother and my close ones as much as I can, within my income, of course. According to Bojena's own version, the entire family pitched in for her flats and the car. 
I have a lot of uncles, actually. That's the money of my entire family. We have a very big family. I have many brothers and sisters, so that's why that's the family's money. Not the money of the minister's niece, but it's her who owns the flats. And she lives in neither of them. The Panorama residents know her as an owner, not as a neighbor. No, she rents it out. The other flat on Konovalcia Street stands empty. The neighbors told us off-camera that they didn't see anyone visit. The minister's niece lives in another place altogether. That's the third one already, and it's owned by her mother. I live in my mom's flat. We found it thanks to Bojana's Instagram yet again. The unusual window on this photo allowed us to find the building on Shevchenko Boulevard and Bojana herself. So the niece of the Minister of Justice bought real estate with someone else's money and doesn't use it. She lives in her mother's flat while investing someone's money in apartments. We have a very big family. I have many brothers and sisters, so that's why it's the family's money. Both the minister and his niece tell vaguely about a large family when asked about the source of the money. I have 22 cousins, a lot of nephews, but the family was always engaged in business. Nobody was a public servant before, that's why we can… We checked the income of Bojana's closest relatives. This didn't confirm this version. Oksana Petrenko, Bojana's mother, currently teaches at the Chernivtsi University. Her father, Rostislav Klichuk, is a GYN oncologist in the Chernivtsi Regional Clinical Treatment Center. The total income of both parents for the last two and a half years is less than $38,000. They come short even of the Lexus. According to the minister's sister, that is, Bojana's mother, the money for the flats was made by Bojana's grandparents. Trust me, my parents, my mother and my late father have worked all their lives. They were entrepreneurs, they earned the money and could buy things. My father died 10 years ago. He died, but he left money for his daughter, that's me, and for his granddaughter, so that the child would have money. As soon as we started asking why they started investing the money 10 years after they inherited it, their versions changed. One flat was given by the grandmother, we are only planning something for it. And the second flat is also a gift, I think. She's a girl, you see? And here's one more. If you take a look at her family on the father's side, you'll see that the people there are fairly wealthy, and they work. Do you mean on Mr. Roman Klichuk's side? Yes, yes. The minister's niece does have a paternal uncle, that's Roman Klichuk, a businessman from Chernivtsi. He's called a philanthropist there. Klichuk himself told us that he didn't give his niece millions. No, you see, I do help her financially, but you asked about the flats, not the flats. I didn't help with the flats. I help her pay tuition fees, for example, or some trips abroad, or a vacation by the sea. I help with that, but not amounts like this. Real estate, cars, no. Of all the family, the one who could afford to buy the flats is the minister himself. Moreover, Petrenko's declared income saw a steady increase during his term at the head of the Ministry of Justice. In 2013, his income and savings amounted to about $460,000, according to the declaration. In 2017, the amount had increased to about $1,840,000, most of it in cash and on bank accounts. The minister keeps in touch with his sister's daughter, that is his niece, proved by their shared vacation in May. However, he denies his involvement in the investment. 
чи не забагато плутаних версій. Aren't there too many inconsistent versions? Grandma's gifts, anonymous paternal relatives, the wealthiest of who says he didn't give that much money, and the mysterious inheritance of 10 years past. And Bojena got the luxury flats and the car only after her uncle became the Minister of Justice, and his savings saw a rapid increase. All people are equal, but some are prosecutors. That's true, but not today. Today, we'll say that all prosecutors are equal, but some of them are the leadership. Natalia Kasyanenko dug up a wonderful story about how two instances of the same offense, driving under the influence, by the way, it is a bad thing to do, don't do this, even if you're a prosecutor, had completely different consequences. In one case, it was an ordinary prosecutor, and the discipline Commission kicked him out of his office on principle. And in the other case, it was the head of the disciplinary commission, and they acted on principle yet again. But this time, the principle was totally different. At last, the prosecution system got a body which can cleanse it of bribe takers, drunks, and just people who made a mistake in choosing the profession. It seems that the motto of law, honor, dignity would become relevant again. The conscience of the prosecution lies behind these doors. Members of the Disciplinary Commission of Prosecutors gather here. It was created a year ago, in particular to punish the prosecution employees for offenses. I'd never have thought that my career in prosecution would end like this. I'd never have thought that I would stand on the other side of the barricades. The punishments range from demerits to bans on promotions and end up to dismissal. It's almost impossible to find work because of that incomprehensible entry in my employment history. Serhi Peresunko got the commission's strictest punishment, dismissal, for a very serious offense. He was caught driving under the influence. Now he's an unemployed ex-prosecutor. I'm not going to try to avoid or deny it, I admitted this. I worked for eight years with no work-related issues. A drunk prosecutor at the wheel is a fired one. A fired prosecutor is more integrity in the office. The commission can punish harshly even for amended mistakes. That's what happened to Serhi Peresunko, who was caught by the police back in 2016. That's when he paid the fine. I paid the fine myself, the right way. I took responsibility for my offenses. This way I was brought to both administrative and disciplinary responsibility. Twice for the same offense. Everyone makes mistakes, but the commission made it clear that you can't work at the prosecutor's office after this, on Parasunko's example. But in several other cases, you can. The one to sign Parasunko's dismissal was the head of the commission, the prosecutor Vitaly Hrushkovsky. Soon, he was caught with the same offense. On the night of March 25th near Vinitsa, the patrol police drew up a report on him for driving under the influence. Any citizen can be detained by the police. Unlike Parasunko, Hrushkovsky didn't pay the fine. He wasn't punished by the commission either. He didn't get a demerit, get dismissed or banned from promotion. Nothing. There wasn't even a complaint. How is this possible? Are you looking for some dirt on me? Serhi Perusunko didn't deny committing the offense. I admitted this. Now he's looking for a job. I have a child now. I need to provide for my family, but I'm currently unable to do this properly. While the head of the commission that dismissed Perusunko is fine. Not least because he denies everything. Did you drive under the influence? Of course not. Why did the police report you then? I don't drink alcohol, I have hypertension. Both verbally and on paper. Rushkovsky got a medical report and an acquittal under suspicious circumstances. He refused to take an alcohol test on the spot. Instead, he got a medical examination on his own.
Yes, I went to a clinic. Why did you refuse to do it on the spot? I proposed to the police officers to go to the clinic with me. Didn't they suggest using a special tester on the spot? I took the test in a medical facility. Why not on the spot? I wanted to do it at a clinic. It's legal. The law says that an examination at a medical facility must still be done in the presence of the police. Otherwise, it's considered invalid. The police didn't escort him to the clinic, makes us doubt their professionalism. But to be able to state that he was driving sober, the examination should have been supervised by the police. Instead, the court acquitted him based on an invalid document. And the court itself was selected in a shady way. It was the Kalinivka Rayon Court of Vinitsa Oblast. It should have been the Vinitsa City Court. It's even mentioned in the police report, because the prosecutor was caught near Vinitsa. An alternative could be the prosecutor's local court. And Hruskovsky lives in Kiev. He told the patrol officers his Kiev address when he was caught. The prosecutor didn't declare having any apartments in Kalinivka. Do you live in Kalinivka? I live there too. Do you have a house there? I don't. I rented a house there. Before that? This year. So after the police filed the reports, a Kiev-based prosecutor remembered a house 250 kilometers away from Kiev, which he allegedly rented out not long before he was caught. He told the law enforcers about this, and somebody decided to transfer the case. So we have an alleged medical exam, court change, and a court decision based on a medical note, which is considered invalid by the law. One has to be really optimistic to believe that the patrol officers made a mistake judging the prosecutor's sobriety at the wheel. In the end, the police report didn't have any consequences for him, but allowed for the discovery of a lot about the prosecutor. The disciplinary head of the prosecution got a new car, a Toyota Camry, which he was driving when he was stopped by the police. The car was bought this year. It's registered to a woman from Vinitsa Oblast, while he is the one using it. And not only in his native region, but in Kiev as well. He says he gets to use it for free. We're relatives. Relatives, yeah? So she... I can't tell you all of my... Are you using it for free? Yes. Yes? They didn't take it back yet. When they do, I'll buy one this year. Another thing, the head of the disciplinary commission doesn't live in the apartments on the outskirts of Kiev, he declared at the end of 2017. He gave the police an address in the center of Kiev. I gave it because I live there. So that was earlier? Of course. You don't live there anymore? No, I don't. If the prosecutor moved this year, then last year's declaration is right, but his alleged neighbors don't remember him at all. No, I definitely don't. He himself said the last time he visited the declared flat was a year ago. When was the last time you were there? Last year. Last year? And now? In May. I was there in May. So where did he live after May 2017, considering that he didn't declare any other flats in Kiev? Why didn't you declare the car? I didn't declare my car because during the filing of the declaration I was having a complicated relationship with my wife. You are all smiling at my words, but there's nothing funny about this. I smile when I think of that. I understand that you'll smile. 2018 seems to be a good year for the members of the Disciplinary Commission. They smile a lot and have fun during the meetings. Their handwriting is different here. I see that. The small hand, that's this one, that's mine. Ordinary prosecutors reviewed by the commission are not amused. The commission's decision was too harsh. They didn't give me a chance to make amends. They don't get a chance to have a free car, move to the center of Kiev, or get away with being reported for driving under the influence. 
unlike the head of the commission, who is responsible for giving out punishment to offenders. Throughout the year of operation, six prosecutors were fired for drunk driving, three banned from promotion, and one received a demerit. However, the person you won't see on this list is Vitaly Hrushkovsky, the head of this commission. That's all for today. Show love to your relatives, in the boundaries of the criminal code, of course. Never drive drunk, watch us on YouTube, and subscribe to our channel. Follow us on social media and leave your comments. If you have an interesting topic, write us an email. See you on air in a week. This was Dennis Bihus with the program Our Money. Goodbye.